Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest Retire Invest Newcastle and Lower Hunter webinar. Uh, I think everyone knows I'm Gil Gordon. Uh, we were meant to be joined by Ryan Muir today, but Ryan's one step short of being put down like a good horse. He's got a very sore throat. And yes, he has been tested for COVID, but we're pretty sure he's right. Uh, so Ryan sends his apologies to us this morning. I'm just going to share the screen and get started. We've got quite a large number of slides to go through today. Uh, as always, uh, please feel free to, to pop any questions in via the chat box and, and so forth. We, um, we've given enough of these now to not be, uh, not be worried about being interrupted. But I'll get into it because we've got quite a few slides to go through. It's been very interesting sort of month, particularly with what's happened in Victoria. And uh, there's been some interesting developments in the United States in terms of what the Federal Reserve is doing over there and how I think that's all gonna play into uh, your portfolios and your family's net wealth and things. So I'm gonna get into it straight away. Uh, so we'll start in with a little bit of housekeeping. I'm gonna to struggle to keep it under 30 minutes today. So I'm gonna talk fairly quickly. We do have the chat box there. Uh, so if you have any questions, please, click on the chat icon and we will um, respond to them as we go through. Again, if there's any problem with the sound, try turning your video off, but then you'll be, uh, if that's turning your video off, you'll still see the screen. Uh, we will be recording the video and we'll be placing it up on our website. So there's no problem getting access to it if you miss out. So as always, today's a general commentary. I always go too far in telling you what I think, but we will do our best. So, I don't quite know why we can huddle up here, there we are. So, quick market update. I think everybody knows what's happened in Victoria in the last month or so. Uh, it's, it's pretty evident that the, the hotel shutdown has actually caused a lot of problems in, in Victoria and by extension, the rest of the country. We don't, yet know what the economic consequences of it are, but it's it's pretty significant. Now, obviously the, the number of cases have gone down to very low again, and statistically it's almost impossible to keep it at zero. And that's a very good thing. Curiously enough, when you look at the number of cases nationally, we've had 27,000 cases of COVID-19, more than 20,000 of them are in Victoria. The majority have happened since the, the Victorian shutdown occurred. So when you, when you realise that New South Wales is considered to be the gateway to Australia, the, the actual incidents in Australia are very low. Victoria has obviously been a problem. And I think there's a fair amount of pressure politically down there, which we don't need to talk about. The good news is that for, when, you, when you take into account the overseas acquisitions, which is 2,300 in New South Wales, there's been virtually no significant transference of COVID-19 in the community in New South Wales, the big problem happened when, when the hotel problems happened in Victoria. So it's all good in that sense. Uh, we're certainly on the way back. So if I'm just clicking here, we'll go again. When you, when you look at the, the incidents, and this is a national report, 21 cases around Australia in the last 24 hours, as of a couple of days ago, uh, most in Victoria, there's virtually no transmission going on. I don't know what it feels like to you, but when I go out on, on the weekends, it feels like business is normal in, in Maitland area. So I imagine that the same applies for, for most of our clients. Curiously enough, and this is something the media will not have you know, there's only 31 people in bloody hospital in the country with COVID-19. Again, the media loves to tell you it's a major drama, but if we had Ebola in this country and there were 31 pieces, of, people in isolation, it wouldn't be a significant problem. So we, we really don't have a health problem here in this country. What we have is some very strong controls trying to stop it become a problem. We have to accept the law as the way it is, whether or not we agree with it, but we actually don't have a massive overload of the health system anywhere. We actually only have one person, that person being in New South Wales, that's in ICU. So COVID-19 is proving not to be a life-threatening illness for the community, it's obviously a problem for those at risk in the aged care. Now, when we look at the stock markets, the markets are actually in pretty good shape. The Reserve Bank didn't change interest rates. The stock market over the last 
few um, few weeks has been very strong. It's getting back to you know, uh, where it was certainly 12 months ago, where we're looking at probability of another rate cut, and I'm going to get into that later. Unemployment has actually not been as bad as people expected, although it's not going to come down in a hurry. Obviously, they're reducing the government support over the next few months, and that's going to tell an interesting story. But I know in my local coffee shop just next door, uh, Brian's doing okay. Maybe not his best year ever, but he's open and he's serving customers, and there's plenty of them there. So. When you look at the two year figures, uh, our stock market's pretty much where it was a year ago, which is a year and a half ago. It's a pretty strong story, really, uh, given what's going on around the world. Now that goes to a strong initial recovery, but the, the, the economy is fairly resilient. And I'm gonna get into things like house prices and car prices and uh, alcohol consumption and things later on. So generally speaking, this is serious, but not as life-threatening as people were making out. And the way the government's responding is going to make a fairly sure outcome here for us all around the world. So again, if we look at the United States over the last two years, the USA was less responsive to the health concerns and more concerned about the economy, which many would argue about. And certainly there's obviously an election going on over there, but the restrictions were lighter and they've been quicker to, to be dialed back, certainly than Australia and certainly than Victoria. Focus more on the economics and the, and the viral containment. Some sectors of the economy have done very well, and that's these guys, the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. I think there's many jokes around pe people have got to the end of Netflix, they've seen everything that's on there. My brother who lives in Victoria has literally done that. He said he's, he's just trolling through Netflix looking for things to watch. So these are very positive stories because these technology companies have benefited for, by this, this change. And what they've really done is push forward our adoption of technology by five to 10 years. That's a really interesting story. The, there are people saying, is this a tech bubble? The answer appears to be no. The answer appears to be this is a fundamental shift. The fact that you're listening today via Zoom meeting this is a fundamental shift in the way that our, our community is engaging with each other. And that's a very positive story. One of the things that has happened, if you give me, I'm just gonna turn my phone off because I just realized that I haven't. Uh, and that's gonna make a lot of noise, there we go. Your portfolio has actually been helped a little bit by the strength of these technology stocks, helped by the, the fall in the Aussie dollar initially. And as the people in Western Australia have discovered, helped by the Chinese demand for iron ore. So Australia, as usual, is proving to be an insanely resilient economy when, when other places around the world are really struggling. So I'm, I'm actually in a fairly optimistic mood, not about the next three weeks or three months, but the next three years, yes. So we're gonna get into that. We'll look at the budget initially. Now remembering, of course, these are proposals, although I can't really imagine that we're gonna see much objection from the other side of politics. They've brought forward some very large personal tax cuts. They've, they've created some tax incentives for a small business to invest and spend money. Uh, it's all about jobs, all about jobs. Some reforms to super that I don't think are gonna impact anyone in the room here. Uh, they're obviously squeezing another few dollars into people's pockets. But as, as Alan Bond, many of you'd remember Bondi, you gotta move a buck to make a buck. The government's incentive here or program here is designed to simply get money moving in the economy. They don't want money stagnant in your bank account. They want you buying and selling and moving and purchasing and upgrading and downgrading and all these sort of things. As money moves through the economy, the government takes a little bit on the way through. And the, you remember from a webinar I gave some time ago, they talk about the velocity of money. How many times money goes around and around in the economy is a function of the health. So they want to get things supercharged. So interesting. Uh, tax thresholds, which have been, will be applied to this current financial year. They've simply taken out the tax rate, uh, the, the tax threshold that was up to $80,000. They've extended it now to $120,000. They've extended the 19 cent tax rate from 37 to 45,000. From 1 July, 2024, we've really only got three tax rates or four, zero, 19%, 30%, and 45. So they've taken out this mid-tier 40, 37, and 32% tax rate. Now that's actually 
I think going to be very stimulatory, as I'll show you in a minute. But what it means is for every Aussie at the moment, we're looking at a $2,400 tax saving for any, sorry, I say this right, and up to $2,400 tax saving. If you're earning 40,000, it's $10 a week. If you're earning 60,000, it's $200 a week, it's $20 a week. If you're earning 120,000, it's 40 odd dollars a week. And that's pretty strong. If you look at the, the figures coming from 2024, they tell a really strong story. So it was where the tax benefit from this year's tax cuts is up to $2,400. By changing those tax scales the way they've done it, for many of you, you'll, you won't be on these sort of figures, but your children are. But $120,000, instead of $2,400 a year in tax saving, you'll be saving $5,000 a year in taxes. And if they're earning good money up around the $180,000 or $200,000, we're talking about nine dollars to $10,000 a year per person. And this is going to be adding five dollars to $10,000 a year to the average family's take home salary which is gonna be good on the one hand, you can put extra in super, you can buy an investment property, you can spend more money on going out to the supermarket or, or going to the movies. So I, when I ran those numbers on the proposals for 2024, that's actually a really big tax break that they're providing, very Donald Trumpian in the sense that he's taken the view that you should give people the money and they'll spend it. And we'll get into that in a little while. Now, a couple of things that um, probably more affecting your grandchildren than you. Employers can no longer demand that you go into their employer fund. They have to put money into your existing super fund. That's effective from one July next year. Employees can still choose to belong to the, the industry fund or whatever they wish. But this is a gradual erosion of the rights of the union movement to demand that money be put into the industry super funds. There's going to be a tool which is not going to affect you. It's called your super comparison tool. The ATO will provide this report every three months, I believe, and the media will pick up on it. And it's going to be ranking funds based on fees and returns. Now, my super funds are not the funds you're in. They are simple, low fee, single option investment choices out there that were introduced a few years ago to, to help um, the average employee not be ripped off by higher fees. The tool will not include the kind of funds you're involved in. So most of my super funds, if I look at the average client and the people I know that are in this room, most of you are, are, are paying fees at or below what the my super funds are anyway, because the professionally managed funds are ones we use. They're very well researched, they're very diversified, and the fees are generally pretty sharp. Uh, many well-known super funds, and this is really important that I get this out there, there are many old, dull funds out there that are still under the MySuper legacy that can't be closed because uh, the clients, the members, refuse to take their money out of them. So the, the reporting seems to love to point out names that, that I know for a fact the people that run those funds would rather close, but they can't because they can't kick a member out. The member has to decide to take their money out. They can't force a member out. So we get a, a bit of a distortion here where they love to name a few names like Colonial, Mutual, and I think One Path has got an old fund that no, none of our clients are anywhere near, but it still keeps coming up. You know, the way the media portrays it is they blame the, the, the fund manager for being a very high fee manager, when in reality, it's just that old expensive product. So if you look at the Colonials of the world, some of their fees are some of the sharpest in the industry and beat the industry funds by a long way, but they do have these old legacy funds that they're not allowed to shut down. So don't overthink this stuff. They're gonna be reporting poor performance and, and, and high fees, but none of your funds are in there. Uh, if they do show the fund managers to be you know, poor performing funds, then they'll be forced to close after a couple of years. But again, that doesn't mean they're shutting them down. It just means they can't take new money. So don't overthink this stuff. Uh, Social Security, the government's gonna give you another $250 each, if, as long as you're getting an age pension, disability pension, a carer's pension, or vets affairs pension. Uh, those, your, your kids that are getting family tax benefit or carer's allowance, anyone on a Commonwealth Seniors Health Card is gonna be getting a couple of payments of $250. For most of you, my, my feeling is that it isn't actually that big a deal but the government wants you to spend it. So you should go out there and spend it. Now, 
many of you, I don't think in near home care, but it wouldn't surprise me if you have friends or relatives that are. There will be an additional 230,000 home care packages funded across the four levels. The reality I find with most of our clients that are getting home care, most of the problem isn't getting qualifying for the home care packages, it's actually finding someone locally that can support them. So I'm, I'm unsure as to whether this is gonna help a lot of you, but we know there's over 100,000 older Australians waiting for, for the assessment. So they're funding 223,000 more. Whether you can get the resourcing into your home to help you is, is a question. So it's a good thing. Other budget items that may be less relevant to our clients, uh, businesses are gonna be able to grab losses from previous years and use them to reduce this year's income tax. If they wanna go out and buy a new car or buy a piece of machinery, they will be, be able to claim a tax deduction for it. For the many of you, this is perhaps relevant. Most people don't concern themselves with it, but theoretically, granny flats could be taxed if you move in with your children, but those granny flats are not gonna be a, a capital gains tax event now going forward. Uh, if we're looking at a, though, I mean, for anyone that's doing granny flats, I probably should come back to that. Anyone that's considering a granny flat, you've got to do it properly. So that's important that they talk to people like us so that we make sure that Centrelink and, and, and the paperwork are in order. But for the most part, there's no tax consequences at all for, for moving in with your kids. For your children and maybe your grandchildren, it's almost like a, a trainee incentive from the government. They're gonna give up to $200 a week for anyone that hires someone between 16 and 29, $100 a week up to age 35. This requires that the, that the person being hired was on new start allowance or something similar before they, they came to work for you. There is a 50% subsidy for 100,000 new apprentices, which I think is a really good thing. I don't think any of us need to complain to or talk too long about not being able to get a builder or a plumber or an electrician into their home to, to understand that we're, we're, we've got a real shortage. Now, uh, housing is something I'm gonna come back to. They're, they're extending the first home loan deposit scheme to further new construction. So this is basically a lump of money available as long as you're building a new house. I know that the $25,000 uh, scheme for building a new house or doing a $150,000 renovation has really helped the local industry. So this will be another example uh, of the government fostering the building industry, which is really critical in this field and in, in, in this economy. I know that generally speaking, the building industry contributes 50% of the state government revenues. <coughs> Excuse me. In Australia, so building is critical to the health of this nation. And I'll talk about that more in a sec. So broadly speaking, the economy's in reasonable shape. The government's doing the right thing. The, the stock market seems to be holding up. Most of our clients are actually, you know, we haven't had a great year by any means, maybe down two or 3%. Some are down 1% or 0%. But we're seeing that as a good outcome and given the, the craziness that's going on around the world. So I wanna get now into the bit that I find far more interesting, which is talking about what's happening and what it means. So here's an interesting chart. This is the unemployment rate in Australia. After March down here, it skyrocketed. It jumped up quite a long way, but curiously enough, it then went southwards. Everybody as an employer, was very nervous about what it meant for their businesses. So they let casual staff go. And then they found that business wasn't struggling. I think many of you would have had this experience if you ask anybody how business is. They say initially, yes, it was a worry, but I'm finding a lot of people are saying we're having a record year. And that, that is from pool suppliers to builders, to coffee shops, to everybody. It's quite interesting. If we look at the household spending rate, this is fascinating. This is Australia we see a national plummet in March this year of spending. It fell by 12%. Now that's really interesting because that means we're not traveling, we're not going out to dinner, we're not doing all sorts of things. But any of you that have been to Bunnings, you know that they're going gangbusters. And a lot of tradies are very busy. If you look at the savings rate, you're seeing the same thing. That historically, our savings rates have returned to where they were in the 1970s. 
So Australia at the moment is putting money away like we're on a mission. And that's a very positive story because eventually that money is going to be spent. Now, the piece that's really quite fascinating for me is what happened in America. So this is the American incident where the savings rate skyrocketed earlier this year and has subsequently fallen. Now, what we've seen is six months of reduced spending. That has been completely offset by government spending. But this sort of saving, this spike, where it went up to 33% saving and is clearly trending back down to normal. That spike suggests that there's a big bucket of money being saved in America. And I would hazard a guess, it's exactly the same everywhere around the world. So if we look at where we're spending money or where we're not spending money, this is the spending over the last quarter in, in Australia. So the piece I find really interesting we spent more money on, on alcohol. We spent more money on furnishing our house. We spent a little bit more money on gas and electricity because we were at home. But the place where we've reduced the spending, and this is quite peculiar in some sense, we spent less on food, less on cigarettes, less on going out, less on buying new cars, right? and certainly a lot less on travel and hotels and restaurants. Now, the beauty of those things at the bottom end of this graph uh, there is a long-term trend associated with the spending here. We don't have to buy a new car this year, and I'll show you some figures in a second about that. We don't have to buy a new car this year, but we're going to buy a new car within a year or two. Right? We don't have to travel, but we will eventually. There is a tsunami effect. The tide goes out before it comes in. So in this instance, what you're seeing is exactly the tsunami effect where the water's gone out, People have stopped spending for a little while. Something weird is going on, but no one's really giving any thought to the fact that the spending bubble is building up. So people will be spending more money on, if you look at health or clothing and footwear or you know, travel, I'm going away with my wife in a week or so's time just to do a bit of tripping around. This will come back and it'll come back in an absolute tsunami of spending. Here's an interesting one. I find this one fascinating. Consumption, the old, the old adage is in the bad times you invest in alcohol and gambling, right? Consumption has increased from last year. I know because I've got a couple of friends of mine that are in the wine business, their sales have skyrocketed. And I don't mean gone up, I mean skyrocketed. They've doubled and trebled on a monthly basis. So clubs and restaurant sales of alcohol have plummeted. Curiously enough, women have increased their spending on alcohol more than men. So if you look at the bottom of it, uh, the 67% the of men are spending time at home, 64% of women are spending more time at home, 49% of the men are bored, and that means they're harassing the women who are feeling more stressed, which is why the women are drinking. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting thing that 18% of women have increased their spending, uh, their, their consumption of alcohol, whereas only 15% are men. And it's, it's just one of those great truisms where money does eventually flow to alcohol and cigarettes. Curiously enough, we haven't increased our spending much at all. On, alcohol, on tobacco. I found that one fascinating. I went looking for some figures on recreational drugs like ecstasy and ice and things. I couldn't get any accurate data, so I haven't put it up. But we're spending a little bit more on um, tobacco, but not much. Now, new cars, and this is really fascinating. In Victoria, car sales have dropped by 66%. New South Wales, 16. Queensland, 14. All of the major brands, they're down big time on their spending. Now, if you look at all of those major brands, there's not one of them made in Australia. So that means less money's traveling overseas to, to General Motors or to Honda or to BMW or Toyota. Curiously enough, Lamborghini's up for the car sales in August. But that's a fascinating index there that we're simply spending less overseas on foreign cars. Curiously enough, used car prices are up 25% since last year. And the reason is we're not going on public transport. We're, we're using our own cars. So we've gone back to buying a nice used car. And I know, cause I'm looking at, at, at trading my car in at the moment, they are desperate for good quality secondhand cars at the moment, you're getting a real premium on them. So the most popular cars to own, Fords, Holdens, Mazdas, Toyotas, Mitsubishis, Toyota, obviously all the Toyota range. Uh, it's, it's just a funny observation that used car prices have jumped up big time that's good because those assets are already in Australia. 
overseas assets such as new cars, we're spending less on them. And if you go to any car dealership, they can't get new cars in to sell them. So the problem there is as much supply as it is spending. But what it means is that the dollars are staying in Australia at the moment, and that's actually got some positive economic impact. So where does it go from here? What does this look like? I'm not gonna talk about Trump and I'm not gonna talk about Biden. I don't know if you know, but the Americans run a, a warship right through the South China Sea. So the Chinese are annoyed with America at the moment and blah, 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 blah. I've spoken about this before. China needs economic stability. They're gonna make a lot of noise, but in the end, it serves nobody's interest for China and America to actually have a real conflict. So there's gonna be noise, but it will go away. Now, what's really going on? The government is all around the world are engaged in what's called a quantitative easing program. That means they're printing money. The reserve banks are the ones that print the money. Now, technically, the reserve banks are independent of the government, but they really are an arm of the government. Now, what they're really doing, the reserve bank prints a billion dollars and goes and buys government debt. So on the one hand, the government will tell you that we're going to have a government debt problem. But the other, on the other hand, it's the government that bought the debt off itself because it can just print money. So whilst they recognize that it is an independent body, it is a quasi arm of government. Now all around the world, it's a little bit hard to estimate exactly how much money they're gonna print. The governments have said quite honestly that they're going to print as much as they need. And that's gonna be somewhere between six trillion and $20 trillion. I think if you go back to some of the webinars I gave a few months ago, you know, there's only $80 trillion in the world. So if they're printing up to $20 trillion, that's printing 25% of, of the current funds out there in the world. And that's a big lick of money. So where does it go? What happens to all this money? It could go into cash and it could go into government bonds. But to be honest, the returns on cash and bonds at the moment are basically zero. So no one's going to do that. The, the bonds will do a little better, but it's a very low return. I'll get into inflation in a second. It could go into property. Now, there are different types of property. There are office, office blocks. Now, office blocks, it's an interesting dynamic. Many of your kids are working from home right now. The, you don't need to take many people out of the offices before they start to seem empty. And if they're kind of empty, if you've got one, two, three, four office suites empty, all of a sudden rents don't go up anymore. So the office buildings are in for a pretty tough year or two because a lot of people are working from home and it's working. Now, shopping centres all around the country are having interesting times. I don't think that's news to anybody. That A lot of the shops, the Myers and the DJs are in trouble economically. So there's going to be a lot of shutdowns there, which means the Westfields and the, and the Stocklands are going to be struggling a bit for a while. Industrial centres. These are the, the warehouses and the factories and things like that. To be honest, they're hit and miss. In the Hunter Valley, the industrial centres are doing okay. The mining sector is doing okay. But in some parts of, well, certainly in Melbourne, yeah, things are a bit of a struggle at the moment. The one that I think has actually got a lot of positive story wrapped around it are residential houses. There, there's just a lot of reasons, and I'm going to go into that in more detail now. There's a lot of reasons to be positive about the value of properties at the moment. The other place the money will go, because night follows day, it does this, will be the share market. It goes into the banks and the banks lend it to business and business are getting money for 3% and they can make more than 3% with the money. So there's a lot of incentive out there at the moment, a lot of cheap capital, which means businesses can get money to take over other businesses or build, you know, plant and equipment and things like that. If you look since 2008, at the stock markets all around the world when they have printed money. QE stands for quantitative easing, it's printing of money. QE one, two and three were the programs that the American government went into to, to issue capital to rebuild the country's economy after the global financial crisis. And every time they printed money, the stock market went up. Now, this last batch, this is the European Central Bank printing money. This was the Greek debt crisis. This is a standoff between Greece and Germany a few years ago. So the Americans printed money for a while, then the, then the Europeans took over and started printing money. Either way, when the countries 
print money, when the big countries print money, it's got to go somewhere. It ends up in the share market. The share market ends up going up because there's capital there to go up to, to drive it up. So again, all around the world, we're printing money right now. So let's break it down a little bit. In this country, the government's spending money and they've said their debt over the next couple of years is gonna approach $1 trillion. Now the Reserve Bank of Australia is printing money and buying that debt back. In the USA a month ago, month and a half ago, the Federal Reserve met at what's called the Jackson Hole meeting and they did some really interesting things. Now this didn't make it in the media because it's far too technical, but listen to this stuff. This is going to be the driver of what we're gonna experience over the next five years. Historically, since the 1990s, the Clinton era, the reserve banks all around the world have either raised interest rates or lowered interest rates to keep inflation under two to 3%. They didn't want it to get above 3%. They didn't want wages to, to spike out of control. So they've done everything they could to keep inflation under 3%. Now what that's meant is that inflation has actually been in the last few years down around 1%. Now that also means that wages have stalled. And this is why Donald Trump got elected. It's, why, it's what's going on in this country as well. But we haven't really seen wages growth. Now we know that because wages are 50% of the inflation index, but we can tell that broadly speaking, whilst our kids are doing well, they haven't really been getting pay rises. Okay. Now what they're going to do is target a long-term average of two to 3% as opposed to targeting a maximum rate of two to 3%. So if you've been running at 1% for four or five years, that means you can run at 5% for four or five years and the average will, will work out to be two or three. What does this mean? We're going back to a period of higher inflation. Now virtually everybody in the room remembers the, the recession we had to have, remembers Mr. Keating and Mr. Hawke and, and all these sort of things. Howard and Costello largely rode the coattails of the good things that Hawke and Keating did to our economy, floating the Aussie dollar, um, breaking away from a series of standards and, and so forth. The, um, the introduction of the GST was a good thing. But what we've really seen since the 1990s is a period of very low inflation and very stable economic growth. The reality is the thing that's driven this country's health over the last 20, 25 years has been the growth in China and the immigration coming into this country. Both of those things are actually not predicated on wages growth. So we've seen strong economic growth out of China. We've seen massive immigration. The average seems to be about 250,000 people a year. And that means they're buying houses and they're buying food and they're buying cars. So when they come, they keep our economy stronger. That's the great unspoken truth of the Australian economy is immigration is one of the key drivers. My opinion, inflation is good for property and good for business profits because they're going to be charging you more for your food and your petrol but it will return the higher prices, return this country to a growing price rate in a country that's already expensive. So we're going to start to see rises in costs over the next five years. Now, let's talk to property. In this country, there are three things that drive property prices the income that the owners have. Now that might be from rent or from wages. The inflation rate, which as we said, has been quite low and immigration. These are the three eyes of property. When you look at it, immigration has stalled, right? It had to stall, they stopped anyone coming into the country. They will open it up again as soon as they can, but it's going to be a little while coming. The supply of new homes has stalled. So the developers have simply said, we're not going to be putting a lot of risk into building new houses. We've got money in the bank, we're gonna sit on it. We're gonna to wait to see what happens. Better to not go broke than to try to, to build houses that nobody wants. Demand has stalled. People aren't necessarily buying a lot of houses at the moment. You talk to real estate agents, the, the number of houses on the market has slowed down. The number of people buying has slowed down, but it's matched up fairly equally, which is why prices have kept okay. People uh, uh, would appear that right now, despite the nervousness that if you ask a real estate agent if they'd rather have more houses or more buyers, they'll take more houses because I think they have enough buyers. But we're not getting massive price jump at the moment, but nor are we getting decline in prices. Now, the, the final nail in the coffin here is after the Royal Commission, 
the banks are being very difficult about lending money. I've been there through that exercise with several clients lately. They simply have taken two, three, four months to get a loan approval because the banks are meticulous with their paperwork. Now, in and of itself, that's okay. But if you want to kickstart an economy, you've got to get the money flowing. So the next steps in this country, the government will ease pressure on the banks, make it easier for them to lend money. I don't know if you noticed, but Treasurer Frydenberg came out about a week ago and said the responsible lending laws are going to be relaxed. What that means is if a little old lady signs a guarantee for her daughter's home loan and the daughter defaults, then the government's not going to blame the banks for, for, for holding that little old lady to account. If you sign a loan guarantee, you need to know what it means because the government says it's a, basically a buyer beware arrangement. Now, we're going to have a little bit of pressure and, and, and politics around this one because the banks have been very popular to kick from here to next week over the last couple of years. But if you want the money to start flowing through the economy, you need the banks to be able to loosen the money lending principles up. Now, that's going to be very good for bank stocks. Immigration, they will resume as soon as they can. Now, I can't tell you when that is. There's definitely a bunch of factors there that aren't predictable. Rents will rise because there's no new houses coming on the market at the moment. There has been a finishing of the houses, but what we're seeing is the pipeline drying up. And I was talking to a lawyer who specialises the other day, and the other day she specialises in property development, and she says her builders are actually quite bullish, and they're just starting to look around at property again. And I said, how long does the pipeline normally take? And Vicky said, oh, about two years. So in her mind, we're in for a 12 month to 18 month hiatus where there's not gonna be a lot of property out there. Now with the natural demand that comes from the kids getting older and so forth, we're gonna see rents rising. So now we're starting to see the equation. There's less, there's less supply, but there's gonna be demand, right? Interest rates will stay low because the government wants to stimulate the economy. Property developers, as I said, will take one to two years to restart houses and investors, there's always a big hunk of investors that would rather be in the property market than the share market. So all of these factors are going to drive supply and demand in the right direction. And I really struggle to see any arrangement where we don't start to see a recovery in property prices because it's the only safe place to go. You're getting, you're getting a decent, no, so it's not the only safe place, but it's one of the safe places to go. You're going to see decent rents. You're going to see decent stability in terms of prices. And people are going to say, well, I'll put my money in the property market rather than in term deposits, because in term deposits, I get less than 1%. So this is going to be an interesting time. Now, we're going to see cash rates stay down for some time, I think up to five years here, because the government would rather things burn bright and hot for a while. But the markets themselves are going to be volatile. Now, this is an important thing to understand. I know that most of you don't look at the, the television reports every day anyway. But the media is going to continue to do what they do, which is, oh, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It will continue like that because there are going to be all sorts of weird economic effects. For example, the Australian iron ore industry is in great shape. And it was almost to the day that China threatened to make it difficult to import Australian iron ore into China. That was when Brazil ended up in all sorts of trouble. And if you look at the graph of the Australian iron ore price, or the iron ore price internationally, it's just skyrocketed from the minute China, China started to bully us. So right now, Western Australia is one of the very few states in the world which is actually reporting a surplus for the last few months in COVID times. Western Australia is going gangbusters because they make a monster out of iron ore. So there's going to be all sorts of weird positive and negative stories here. We've seen really strong technology stocks in the US. We've seen really strong mining stocks in Australia. Right? We've seen people in China, in Brazil in all sorts of trouble because their economy's got all sorts of trouble around COVID-19. And basically they just can't get the product into the ships to export to China. So despite China's bully boy tactics, if they want good quality iron ore delivered on time with good quality gas and coal and good quality food, they can't get it from South America. They can't get it from India. They can't get it from Europe. They can't get it from North America and Canada as easily as they can get it from Australia. So you take half the supplies in the world out of the equation. What you're left with is a good story for Australia. So 
I'm actually in a fairly bullish mood here. Now, it's really interesting for us over the last six months, watching our clients' portfolios. Some clients have portfolios of direct shares. Historically, in the good times, direct shares do as well as share funds, what we call diversified funds. But the diversified portfolios have returned between minus three and plus one percent over the last six, 12 months. Whereas the direct share portfolios, they're the ones with the minus tens and minus fifteens. Now, it's much harder for a retiree to recover from a 15% loss because they're drawing income out of their portfolio. It's much easier to recover from a three or a four percent loss than a 15 or 20 percent loss. So this is not a time to be particularly aggressive in the way you manage your money and going chasing a particular stock. By all means, if you like playing the stock market, that's fine, that's a hobby. But when we're talking about the bulk of your money, I don't want our clients to take great risks because there is genuine risk out there and we're not gonna be able to predict it. So higher inflation translates to things will get more expensive. Economic growth and wages growth will become the priority for whichever government is in charge. And they're gonna allow inflation and price rises to come in, which means we're going to see the national debt. This is good for politicians. If the economy is growing, it makes a trillion dollar debt seem smaller and more affordable. So it doesn't matter how they spin it, it comes down to this. Everybody wants to see the economy growing again and they'll be willing to put up with higher inflation to get there because it makes the debt seem smaller, it makes the economics seem better and the politicians get reelected. So we are gonna see somewhat of a return to the boom bust cycles of the 80s and 90s. And I don't see that that's a bad thing because we do need a bit of growth all around the world here. Now, the good news is if you talk about a gold mine that is economic growth, Australia sells the picks and the shovels and the wheelbarrows to the gold miners. China is the one producing all the stuff that people buy, Southeast Asia, et cetera, and India. Australia is diversifying its base and identifying other markets to sell its energy and raw materials into. But we, we are actually in a prime position. There's a reason why our economy has been the darling of the world the last 25 years. And I can't see any reasons why that won't continue because everybody wants growth. Everybody wants steel, everybody wants energy. I'm not even gonna get into the, the this global warming and climate change, but it's, um, there's a bunch of reasons now why we're gonna see a fairly positive story about climate change over the next 12 months or so, two years. Expect to see wages growth, expect to see a bit more industrial unrest. We're already seeing that on the, um, the Maritime Union. You know, the dock workers are complaining and not allowing the, the containers in. And I know I just got a call from Bunnings earlier and they're complaining that they can't get product in off the docks. Property and shares should do well over the, over the I think the three to 10 year term here. Remembering, most of you would have seen this picture before, this is how we manage your money. From our point of view, we could chase high returns, but as we talked about, there's risk. We could chase low risk, but as we talked about, that's less than 1% earning rate. You're gonna get no returns. So all you're doing is you're spending money and getting nothing for it. What we'd rather do with the way we manage our client portfolios is identify what your cost of living is and make invest in a way that guarantees that that income can last, excuse me, as long as possible. So we're gonna see what, the way we like to manage it. A couple of years in cash, even though it's not gonna earn much, another two to three years of your money in low risk conservative funds like bonds. That's given us four or five years over on the left-hand side here, where your money and your income needs are fairly safe. On the right-hand side, we're gonna see shares, we're gonna see property, we're gonna see industrial things, we're gonna see infrastructure, we're gonna see currencies. All of the things that you think we invest in are over on the right-hand side. They will have their good and their bad years, but we generally need at least four or five years to leave that money alone to allow it to recover from, from a, you know, an ordinary year. Now, our job in the middle here is to take profits this year, next year, the year after, whenever the right time is, and top up the, the left-hand side of this chart. That's exactly how we manage your money. I've been doing this for 25 years now. This strategy is hands down the best way for retirees to manage their money. It works, it creates the most stability. Many of you have been around, like Graham um, in Taree there, you've been through many of these cycles with us. You've seen the ups and downs, raise another one up that way. You've seen the ups and downs with us. You know that as long as you don't panic, 
we come through these things quite well. So as always, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. The team's expanding. We've got six advisors there now. We've got seven, seven support staff. Uh, things are going pretty well. I'm, for, for many of you that, that talk to me personally, I'm about to take six weeks long service leave and there's a piss off guild rule in place, which means that I'm not allowed to talk to anybody about work. It's been a long few years and uh, I'm under instructions from my wife and other people to just take a break and go and relax and enjoy the, the roses for a little while. So thank you everybody for tuning in today. I haven't seen any questions, but as always, please give any of us a ring, any of the support staff or any of the advisors. We're more than happy to take your call. I really hope you and your families are doing well. I'm in a fairly positive frame going forward here in terms of what we expect over the next two or three years for our clients. So seriously, from all of us, take care, God bless, stay safe. If I don't talk to any of you before Christmas, have a Merry Christmas, but it's been a pleasure talking with you today and we look forward to seeing you soon. All right, take care.